Right, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning of, of, of a very, I suppose, difficult week, uh, especially for some. Uh, we decided to go ahead with our sessions for Professional Care Workers Week this week, uh, trying to do it as respectfully as possible, but also aware that these might be very helpful sessions for some people in the sector, and we're unable to postpone the event. This morning with me, I have Andrea Bruce from Homestead Wigan, who's a care worker, care professional, as yeah. you called in Homestead, and Sophie Coulthard from Judgment Index, a consultant for the care sector. And I'll be asking some questions, both Andrea and Sophie, pitching in myself, and we'll be talking about well-being of care workers. Right, I think Andrea, I'll start start with you if that's okay. Yes. Um, if you could just share with us um, a, a little bit about your journey into care, but especially around well-being challenges that you face working in home care. Um, well, I started my career in the healthcare industry um, is when I was living in in Australia, and so I was a diversional therapist for a facility there. And I just really, really loved the job. And then when I moved to the UK, um, I wanted to sort of um, challenge myself and get out in the community sort of care. And so Home Instead happily employed me and I've just loved it ever since. Um, they are a great um, uh, company to work with and they're very, very supportive. So, um, and it, it's just, it's one of those jobs that you just feel like you're doing something really great for other people. And it makes me feel good that I'm doing that. And it's just kind of a caring person. I like to, to care about people and I like to make sure that everyone is, is happy and well. Yeah, so the role is obviously very rewarding. I was a coach yeah. myself and in home care for many years. Yeah. But, the, but there are definitely challenges, especially around mm -hmm. your own well-being. Could you tell us a bit more about that, please? You get very attached to people. And um, and unfortunately, sometimes they pass. It can be very, very hard just to keep going on. Um, you just have to sort of put it behind you. I mean, I've got we've got a very good supportive app that's there for you that, that gives counselling. So we're lucky on that. And um, the senior carers are really good to help with if you're having struggles. Um, we we have other sort of it's with with being in care um the cost of living has really um made a difference with the fuel because we use our own cars um it's not only just the fuel it's wear and tear on your car as well so i mean most a lot of us do have that as a concern and if anything happened to their car where you know um that's their job like stopped until it's fixed and there's always that worry so you, you try and and be um have money in the bank to be able to have that in case things happen but um with the cost of living it's been harder um it's also we do get struggles when because we're a private um company it's our clients can be based all over the place so you can have like one client at eight o'clock and then you don't have another client till 10 so you have to wait because you don't want to you know go f wasting your fuel you have to wait around and it can be quite stressful that that way but where we work they try and get you into a block as much as they can yeah and I think yeah that's come some of the struggles that we have thank you very much Andrea uh, Faye are you with us now You're on mute. I'm mute. Yes, sorry, I've had trouble connecting. Sorry. No problem at all. Thank you very much for uh, joining us this morning. Thank you. Um, and uh, yes, so Faye is joining us from Methodist Homes, a care manager at Oak Manor. Thank you very much uh, for joining us this, this morning, uh, Faye. So Andrea is from Home Instead. She is a uh, care professional, care worker and Sophie is from Judgment Index. She's a consultant to the care sector. We're just starting a conversation about uh, challenges to the well-being of care workers. And it would be great uh, if you could step in now and just tell us about 
some of the challenges that your team and you personally have faced, especially in the last couple of years? Okay, um, obviously via co well during COVID, um, the care staff were all pulling together, and obviously we saw a lot of um, illness and what you wouldn't necessarily expect. We have quite a young team here, some very new to care, um, and they all pulled together and um, were doing jobs they weren't necessarily employed to do because we all had to um, come together and and basically do whatever was needed. We had um, people very poorly where um, domestics were helping to feed people and give hydrate, you know, hydrate people. And, and I think um, you turn into a, a little bit of a counsellor at the time because you were comforting people as well as your own emotions. You were putting on a brave face for people and basically I'd leave the building and I'd be in torment because I was thinking, could I do something else? Could I have done better? Could I have thought of them um, more? And I think the knock-on effect from that, people are, um, I mean, they've learned a lot and we had to learn really quickly. Um, so I think the the emotional effects on people are uh, were, were horrific at the time, but actually it brought us closer together as a team um that's that that was one benefit out of it we all came together and you were seeing people put all this ppe on it and at first it was like gosh what on earth is going on but actually um it just it just it just showed how how people could come together and unite and and we came i think we came out stronger in the end um but obviously we've had a lot of people with um uh, mental health um the mental health side of things and depression and um that isn't just from COVID but I think it had it had that effect because your emotions were so high during that time um but as a team I think we I always I think we had appreciation days etc just to show how much we do appreciate staff I think it's important to show that I think coming through it now you you we are learning to live a little bit more with with COVID because people are not getting so poorly when they are, you know, they have got uh, have got it. Or so it's just reassuring staff constantly. But you know, what? we're not going to go into panic every time now. We're just going to take it on board, and I just have more interaction with the staff. They just want me a little bit more to reassure them. Um, but now we've learned a lot through COVID, so um, I think just reassuring people and just saying do you know what it's we're not just stop and think um we'll be okay together and we'll get through it so yeah that's basically us lovely thank you and um the cost of living crisis you know is affecting everybody in the country really what are you hearing from your teams around those issues okay so i think the um what i'm hearing is basically it isn't covering a lot of the bills and we are finding that staff turnover is is more because people are finding jobs with a higher rate of pay um obviously the inflation of everything is like petrol fuel um they're constantly saying are we going to be getting a pay rise in line with inflation and of course i think mha do pay you know above the living wage so i think this is good but i think they want more and obviously they see you can work somewhere else out of the care sector for more money so I think this is the problem we've got and that a new care home will open down the road and it, it will give them that little bit more but we have had people leave and come back <laughs> but um you know it, it, you're constantly trying to keep retain your staff and trying to do all different incentives but money talks at the end of the day and I think this is honestly is the problem. Um, if if the, you can in, if you can entice people with money, it retains people. Not only the working environment, because I think we have quite a good working environment but across the sector. We're all struggling, I think, to retain staff. Yeah, I think especially at the moment, like you say, yeah. everything's gotten more expensive, yeah. and five pounds a month makes a difference. Yeah. 
to people in, in a way more so than maybe before uh because like you mentioned you know people are employed full, full time earning above living wage and they still can't afford the basics and 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 that's very difficult now sophie you work with some uh providers in the care sector um what have you been well what was your experience during COVID, and also what have you been hearing recently around the cost of living crisis in relation to well-being of care workers yeah so hello everyone i'm um, really interesting to hear Andrea and, and Faye talk because I think something that Faye said um, I really picked up on is that people kind of did band together during COVID um, and we've definitely found so we've done quite a lot of research on people working within the sector and during COVID um, or kind of as we were coming out of COVID we started to run some stats and data based on based on people who who'd taken our assessment and what we found is that during or pre-COVID um, people, people in this sector have always generally been able to handle what, what, what's thrown at them and they've been able to handle stress, they've been, been able to handle the pressure of the job, obviously it comes with the job quite a lot of the time. Um, and when we saw, when we looked at the data during and post COVID was actually really similar. A lot of people were talking about burnout and, and everything from COVID, but what we saw is that people were able to handle that, that stress and pressure, which I think is what, what Faye was saying. Um, but what we've seen since is that people from from my clients I'm definitely hearing this word languishing a lot the staff seem to be languishing like it's almost like um delayed energy loss um almost like well we did all of that and now the crash has started to happen when it comes to well-being but what we also saw is that while people were able to handle the stress and pressure at work where we've noticed a real difference in results getting weaker is in things like self-esteem self-criticism self-regard so it's almost like I can come into work and I can handle this I can handle this job and I can do my job but underneath it all I'm feeling underconfident I'm starting to doubt myself as Faye said with people starting to feel a bit nervous about making decisions perhaps or um you know wanting that reassurance um in terms of of well-being these are the types of things that I look at in my work things you know not not um uh, physical or, or financial well-being that side of things but more of the um mental emotional behavioral um aspects so yeah it, that's what we're seeing is a real lack of confidence low self-esteem people being a lot more self-critical almost like they've personalized all that stress basically and you mentioned that during covid people came together very well have they stayed together or do you feel that people are becoming more insular now I feel like there's just a challenge now. And I think that what I'm hearing from, from I've heard some incredible things from managers about how one of them said it, it felt like we were a, a team going to war, essentially. You know, we, we were in it together. We had this almost feeling of, of um, you know, a mission that, that, that they were on to support their, their clients and residents. Um, but what I'm seeing now is things like, and now everyone's turning to the manager for that support the the confidence is gone people are afraid to make decisions um the 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 mood is sort of down within the homes or or, or environments that we're working with and so you know and now especially with this cost of living crisis which i've not started to delve into with my clients yet um but i think that there's that feeling of well what can we do how can we build a, a positive culture and a positive environment because I think you're right now more than any other time people maybe will be more inclined to leave for that extra 10p or that extra 50p or whatever it may be so being able to have a positive culture where people do feel valued do feel supported um, and they feel that like their well-being is is cared about by by the team um that is going to be the key i'm not saying you can retain everyone but there's probably things that can be done um because the chances are people will move somewhere for an extra 50p and then they might think well actually i don't feel valued here um and i'm sure that on a on a regular day most people would rather be somewhere where they feel valued than than um than not but i appreciate at this time with with cost of living it's it's a bit of a different situation Lovely. Thank you, Sophie. Um, Andrea, could you tell us a bit about what support you have in place at the moment uh, at Home Instead? Yep. At Home Instead, we have um, 
we have an app. Um, it's it's um, we can go on to get support, um, counselling. Um, um, it just keeps us up to date with things and um, tips on how to manage your money and how to um, manage your life and in, in in the way in what we're going through at the moment with this crisis. So it's very helpful. And every person, that, um, our, all of our care professionals um, have access to that, and it's free. Um, and so that's that's good. Um, uh, we. Do you find yourself using the app often? I do. I do. It's 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 got a lot of good little tips. It's got recipes. It's got the yoga. It's just got all these nice mindfulness sort of activities that you can do as well which really helps um, bring your mood up and, and that because you, you sometimes you, you, because you're with that person, our clients, um, and you're trying to and put, you know, um, bring them up because a lot of these people, they, they stay at home and they don't see anyone and you are there linked to the outside world and you've got to be bubbly every single day, even if you don't feel like it. So it can be hard on you and inside, but you've got to show on the outside that you're supporting them and that's what we want to do we we love supporting our our clients and um so it can be hard emotionally you just got to have that personality that um and that's what our our caregivers all have is that shining personality yeah and in terms of support for your well-being that you get from your managers yes they're great they you're aware available they're available every day um, five days a week, we can come in, um, get a glass, like get a bottle of water and some chips, and have a chat and a cup of tea. Um, all our caregivers, are, um, care professionals, are welcome to come in, and we like to see them come in, which is it's, it's good. Great, thank you, Andrea. And Faye, in terms of you know, you've you've mentioned um, already a little bit around the support that you offer to your teams. Uh, could you elaborate on that and you know any any particular things that you already have in place that mm -hmm. you you're working with to support the well-being of your team mha do have a well-being service um so you can bring a counselor i haven't personally used it myself uh, but it's something we send out to the staff uh, we have a chaplain on site as well so he also speaks to people if and when needed and that's for our employees and even ex-employees as well. So um, he speaks to everyone. Um, I always have my, I always have got, my doors are open unless it's closed, if I'm in the meetings. So, and to be quite honest, staff are, they will come and confide in me. Um, I do have a good relationship, working relationship with the staff here. So I think um, if they have problems, they come and they will talk. Um, I did send out, I send out a familiar gazette now and again, where um, it'll have all, everything in. So what services and the Samaritans, just so they know that there are, there's somebody out there to talk to. Um, and that went down very well. I sent that out to all of the staff not so long ago. And I just put little quotes in there to make it nice. And um, we have staff appreciation days. So I make sure I appreciate the staff um, and we it's I can never find never seem to find that what I want to show them how to appreciate them but we did personalized glasses with little angels in and things um, and not so long ago we did cakes and things just to let them know that we do appreciate them and I mean I do appreciate them and I do appreciate the hard work and everything we've gone through um, Yes, but it's, I think it's about showing people you actually care and that you will give them the time when needed. And I hope I do that. I am on call 24 seven too. So, you know, and everyone knows my number. So I, I try to be that person what people will confide in. Being on call 24 seven must be very difficult. What kind of support do you have in place? Oh, I have a great team. I do have a great team. I have a great manager. Um, and there's always someone I'm, I'm very I feel very privileged at MHA I really do because there's always someone even through COVID I I was a new manager uh, just as COVID um, hit so and my deputy was me basically I went for deputy to manager 
and a senior to deputy. So we sat here and we thought, oh, okay, we're on our own now. So um, we, we sat here and we like, oh, okay. Because um, obviously nobody was coming in, nobody was going out. Uh, but if I needed anyone at any stage, there's always somebody. And I, I, I learned very fast. We learned to run very quickly. Um, but yeah, so I feel very privileged because I know I have, I also have friends who are counsellors as well. So I'm quite lucky in that respect. Um, but MHA as a whole, I'm quite an advocate for MHA because I feel very supported. Um, so I feel anytime I can ring anybody and find out anything. And my manager was always there when I was going home crying. So, oh my gosh. And she'd always listen to me. So I felt very supported. Lovely. Thank you. And Sophie, in terms of what you know, what care providers already have in place, uh, what has worked, let's say, through COVID or in the first half of this year? Are there yeah. good practice ideas that you could share? Good practice, yeah, definitely. I think I think first of all, it's it's having an understanding of what's your interpretation of well-being and what's your staff's interpretation of well-being as well, and maybe getting a bit clear on that with them, whether that's just through a bit of a brainstorming session. Um, I think a lot of people I think the problem with well-being is it's quite a sort of fluffy word, and people go, "Well, what do we do? do should we should we all do a yoga class or a meditation or something?" and and that's all fine. I don't have a problem with any of that stuff, but the chances are it's not going to have a, a meaningful impact on on the collective. You know, it might might work for for a few people. Um, so I think it's about understanding, um, you know, what, how do people see well being? Um, and obviously, I've already said, kind of from my perspective, it's about things like that self esteem, self confidence piece. Um, it's about helping the staff to be less less critical of themselves. Um, you know, just so that everybody's well being can move up and they can not only feel better in themselves but perform better at work as well because that's the, the positive ripple effect so things that I've seen that have worked really well so a client of ours um they won't mind me naming them called Eden Care at Home who are a care home provider they they started with a survey so survey out to all staff with just some really simple questions um just saying you know what is it that you're struggling with right now kind of understand and obviously a lot of people are going to say the cost of living crisis but can they be a bit more specific than that is it about child care and maybe then you might be able to be a bit more flexible with your shift pattern is it about the fuel is there anything you can do there in terms of lift sharing i don't know just trying to be a bit creative really by listening to what people what is really affecting people right now um, so that was something that they did. Um, they also launched, uh, so they they then launched a bit of a wellbeing initiative. They announced it to the team. And I think the communication is really important around this as well. Um, I think the danger at the moment is you're going to have a lot of cynical people. If you if you go out there and say, hey, we're going to launch a wellbeing initiative, people will be like, oh, you know, don't you think we've got enough to deal with right now? What's this actually going to do? Um, but getting a couple of enthusiastic people from your team who can be champions for it, who can, you know, be the in-between that can that can get ideas, um, you know, and put suggestions forward and perhaps doing some kind of communication, whether that's putting something up on a notice board or having a newsletter that goes around. Um, but I would say the real key things to think about um, will be around, yeah, how can you build confidence in people? So whether that's about... Uh, this is something that managers I know can get stuck in sometimes tell often you're telling people what to do it's the quickest way to get things done um, it gets the results that you want but instead thinking a little bit more about how you can coach people instead well, what do you think the right thing to do is what would you what would be your gut instinct of what to do that's going to help build confidence in people um, thinking about whether the culture has a bit of a blame culture which we see quite a lot as well um, and how you might be able to make a shift with that um criticism comes into this as well we find particularly team leaders if they're very self-critical that can spill out into negativity on others and obviously part of this job is about spotting what's wrong that's the natural instinct what's wrong here what's wrong there well how can you spot the good what's the positive what's the appreciation and it's interesting because you you talk about appreciation like it's oh it's nothing you know we, we did this little thing for people or we did cakes but 
it's amazing how much the thank you or a little handwritten note or a text at the end of the week can make such a difference. Um, and I think if you actually started, you know, if there's any managers watching this going, well, what could we do is maybe write down those those three things or I could name more. Maybe I won't throw too much at you, but self-confidence and self-esteem self-criticism and then self-regard how people are taking that time for them I was going to say Faith if you're on call 24 hours what's your well-being like how do you separate yourself from from work when you need to get your energy back um, and just start to brainstorm out of those how can we do little things because it's all the little things that make the difference it's not one single thing that's gonna solve this unfortunately Thanks a lot, Sophie. I think from my own experience, which was majority before COVID and, and the first few months of COVID, I think the piece about being able to reach people and somebody there, especially I think in home care, actually, somebody being there at the other end of the phone or somebody having the door open for the office that you know that you can speak to people. Um, <clears throat> and I know many care workers over the years, as I monitor online forums for care workers, have found that to be a struggle, have found that lack of direct access to somebody to talk to uh, a big problem. And obviously, you know, there are a lot of reasons around that. I suppose um, around COVID, one of the, the biggest barriers to that was just ever-changing daily guidance and people having to keep on top of that and spending an hours and hours of the day every day <clears throat> making sure that they're actually following the rules that were forever changing. Um, but yes, from my personal experience and, and what other care workers share, it is that conversation, it is that direct support, knowing that somebody is there for you, that really makes a, a very big difference as well. Yeah. And um, Andrea, what do you think would help that could be done more for a care worker in your role? That like, if you if money was of no you know yep. problem and if you could think of, of of anything that could support your well-being what would be helpful right now so as a lone worker we're often you know by ourselves we don't see tend to see the other team members that put in time with the client so just to have like a, a team meeting um regularly would be good just to catch up with other people and what they're doing and and um, because if you if you feel well supported and if you have team meetings it sort of brings us that we're in this together sort of feel and it, it makes you feel proud of what you're doing because you've got other people that are going through it as well so I think like that was good that that would be good um, we've already got an inflated pay where I work with to help with the cost of, of living and um, and things like that. But I mean, obviously it does make a big, you know, it, with, you just don't know what's happening with the future, unfortunately at the moment. Um, so yeah, just having that support because you're, you know, in, a, in an isolated place, it's nice to know that you've got other people to, to support you and know who those caregivers are so that we can, you know, support each other as well. Yeah, that's like, yeah. And what um, I think was uh, Sophie was saying, um, just sending a nice message out to your employees, um, it just makes them feel better. Like when all the COVID thing was happening, everyone was right behind all the NHS workers and everyone was right behind all the care workers and it feels good it feels good to know that you're this hero and now that it's sort of gone away a little bit and people are getting these cost of living it just feels like you don't matter anymore and um i think that it's it's hard it's it's hard because we we do everything we can to make positive um influence in our society and um yeah and to be sometimes referred to as just a caregiver can be quite hard you see that on the media quite a bit yeah yeah thank you I, I i think there's definitely a strong point there in terms of public perceptions and lack of appreciation yeah, yeah. apart from a few clubs here and there i don't think social care gets the respect that it really needs to get and and people yeah. still do tend to look down at care workers um yeah. 
not recognizing care workers as skilled professionals, as people that do, you know, very important work that not just anybody can do, not anybody just should do. <laughs> and um, yes, that supporting people's lives is a, it's a very important job and it should be much better appreciated and respected within the wider society, not just in, in our sector. Um, Faye, I expect if money was no object, first of all, you'd pay your team through the roof. I <laughs> would. <laughs> uh, I but, really would. Yeah, but aside from pay, are there any things that um, you are planning to do to support your teams? Are there any things that you would like to do, but at the moment there are barriers in place that you can't really deliver? Or is there anything for yourself that you think would really help support your well-being? I think um, I think appreciation is my major thing with the stuff I need. Uh, if I could show stuff, I know I say it's only little bits. I do make sure I appreciate everybody, and I do. It, and this is on my conscience quite a lot. Um, I think immediately what I'd like to is, I, I think the pay would be a big thing, and um, I know it always boils down to money, but I do think, and also. No, no, sorry, I've jumped from one thing to another. It's not something else. It's like you said, it's to be appreciated by people. I think relatives appreciate. Um, they do. I put, I use Facebook as a quite a, it's a big platform for our, our home, especially. So I show it with the local community. We're starting to get recognition in the community, um, and they are showing appreciation. Um, I put something up just a couple of weeks ago and um, for carehome.co.uk and I think some people don't even realise we're in the village so getting recognition from them and someone said actually made a quote it's good to know we've got a good home close by because we've got something like top 20 in the east of England so it was a big thing for us so I shared it here there and everywhere just so that we can get that recognition and the staff can actually think well yeah our hard work is paying off so I think getting that recognition across the board that they're not just coming to work and you know people walk in this but they're special people who work in this building no matter who they are and I don't just mean in this building I mean across the sector I do but um you know you can't you, like you said you can't just do this job you can't just it's not just a job that anyone can do you have to be a special person to do it and I think they do need more recognition it needs recognition what these special people are doing. Sophie, you spoke a lot about self-esteem, self-regard. Do you think an improved societal recognition and respect for social care would improve on those things? I think it would definitely go some way to help, 100%. Yeah, and I, I think that's such a simple thing, getting out there into the community and having them know who you are and understand and feel proud that they have a, a good care home locally. Um, we obviously saw loads of success with things like Channel 4's um, Old People's Home for Four-Year-Olds and, you know, actually bringing the community into the care setting as well, which I think is really, really powerful. Um, I think that I think there's a lot of things. I think that that there may be something in in people that work within this sector that that their energy is naturally going to others that that's that's their calling is to give to others to support others and very often when you do that you do neglect yourself um, and I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that or maybe even just during times in their life where it's been all about other other people and what's left for me um and so that can have an impact obviously um I think I think within the care sector and within media, I mean, good luck with that. We've struggled to turn, turn what the media says around. But, you know, I think I think a collective effort to to work on these things will boost well-being and it will it will help to, to deliver recognition to the sector. Um, do you mind just picking up on something um, that Andrea said about um, when you were talking about how you can build this community? I think this is something with people that work in home care really feel a lot you're out on your own all day uh, you've done it Carolina you're out on your own all day and you might not speak to another person and I know not in a care setting but I did a job like that where I wouldn't hear from my boss all week and I think do they even care about me um, and I think some of the things that have been quite successful with home care is finding things like 
are there a couple of places in the local community like if it's a cafe or even a church cafe is always a really good one where they might do some kind of discount for for the the professionals that work for that company and it can almost become a little bit of a hub if you haven't got one sounds like you've got an office where people can come to Andrea but yeah. it's not always the case um is there little places that can become these little hub pockets um that staff could could visit and 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 interact with each other a bit more um the company that I talked about earlier in their well-being newsletter that they were sending out I don't know how often they were doing it, but they were doing almost like a profile piece on people that work there. And um, one of the ladies, she was from um, uh, South Asia and she'd written in her profile about where she was from and, and how her family had come to the UK. And, and she said she couldn't believe how many people came up and talked to her about it because they felt like they knew her better then. And there was this connection suddenly between different people that work on the same team that might not really know each other. Um, and we're social creatures at the end of the day, even if we do work on our own. So trying to find ways to build that community within the team um, yeah. and go a long way. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sophia. Yes, I think definitely it is a, somehow a bigger challenge in home care when people are lone workers and, and go on their own um, whole day. So I remember that, you know, feeling at times, even though I was seeing, you know, five to ten people a day I'd still feel lonely and that's it, a very weird feeling to have in a way um and yes because you're working with people you're visiting them it's not like suddenly everybody can take a day off because who's going to visit people yeah. so even for a team meeting that's really impossible uh, and I know in one company I used to work for we used to do it in two halves you know half of the team would meet and then the other half of the team would meet but it is it is a big challenge and I think when it is my impression at the moment that everybody's mental health is under strain for from what we've been through in the last two and a half years and what we are facing now with the cost of living crisis as well and I think people are finding even more difficult to make connections make friendships or you know talk to colleagues because it's difficult to find positive things to talk about it, it is harder than it used to be I think and and people don't want to be perceived as you know that's the one that always moans and always is, is always negative but if you have nothing positive to say it's very difficult so what you mentioned Sophie maybe you know sharing different things about yourself that are not necessarily good or bad but are just you know things about yourself where, where you're from or what are you interested in etc cetera, etc cetera. Almost to the extent of show and tell day at school, I suppose, <laughs> that, you know, people can pick up on each other's interests and, and hobbies might be a good way forward for people to feel some sort of connection and sense of belonging. Because I've said for many years now, you know, with social care as a sector being as fragmented as it is, not under one, you know, not like in the NHS, you have one organisation, one banner, one logo, one employer. We don't have that in social care and we don't have registration in social care and all of those things care workers are not considered professionals by majority of the society all of that really comes down to care workers not having that sense of belonging to something bigger and, and that's a difficult thing to to struggle with in terms of your own identity and i think long term in terms of sector reform we really need to look at addressing that you know, whatever form it, it may take, you know, people are talking about national care service, we're talking about registration, we're talking about cards for care workers, we had the care badge, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually finding one thing that could bring all care workers together, you say, at the world, individual providers are doing great work, and they're trying their best in supporting their teams, but I think it needs to go beyond your employer. Um, and hopefully that would also help, you know, with, with the self, self-regard, self-esteem, general feeling how people perceive themselves as a care worker, that being a care worker is a thing to be proud of, rather than what media seems to present a lot of the time or the wider society does, that it's something to be ashamed of because you're still just a care worker, and that means you have no skill or no ambition and nowhere to go because just anybody can do this job and I think that's a very difficult narrative to be working against to support care workers well-being 
around because you start from the point or from a very, very low point and you need to build up from there. Uh, and I think it's an incredibly difficult challenge uh, for employers, for managers, and for coworkers themselves to try and stay positive about these things. Uh, and we at the charity, we try to champion coworkers as skilled professionals. We lobby to the government about coworkers being recognized better, the sector being funded much better than it is. Uh, and you know we'll we'll see where that goes now with the new Secretary of State. Uh, you know we'll we'll have to see what's the new direction uh, of the Department of Health and Social Care. But I think work, Andrea, that you do, you know, supporting people every day and supporting your colleagues and Faye working with people, looking after your teams, hopefully looking after yourself as well, uh, and uh, and Sophie, you know, supporting people, trying to give them more ideas of how to actually, like you said, work out what is wrong, but not in general terms, but more in detail, and then try to address it in a very practical way of what people actually need, uh, rather than very generic, let's everybody try this, because those things don't necessarily, what necessarily help everybody. I think if when, once all of that comes together, you know, hopefully we'll see fewer people leave the sector because at the moment it is rather grim uh yeah more more people stay and more people join because that's important as well retention is definitely for me the biggest challenge because we need to be able to keep people who are already very skilled uh, and are experts in the field but we also need to be able to recruit more people because staff shortages are one of the things that are really affecting well-being aren't they so yeah well, thank you. Would any of you like to add anything else around well-being or care workers? I would just say, if, if you're watching this and you're thinking, well, what can we do? Just try and have that conversation with your team, directly with them. Try and think outside the box. Try and go and see what companies outside of this sector are doing to support well-being as well, because you can get some great ideas from companies, um, you know, that, that don't necessarily do the same thing. Um, doesn't always have to cut need for a budget either. Uh, it's very basic what we want as humans. We want to feel of worth, you know, we want to feel valued. So, um, you know, you don't have to come up with, with crazy ideas to, to make people feel that way. Andrea, anything else from you? Um, yeah, just feeling supported. It's it does go a long way into making you feel appreciated, and um, and you know I think um, oh, well I'm lucky where I work. They they are very very supportive, um, and yeah, it this cost of living. It's it's causing a lot of people just don't know what's happening at the moment. It's very volatile, and um, of course, we'd love we'd love to all get big pay rises, but at the end of the day, we need the government to be able to support that. That needs to come from higher up. So, um, yeah, I'm just I just love the work I do, and um, and I'll continue to do it for as long as I can. <laughs> the same with me. The same with me. I've been doing this a long time. Um, I think it's about twenty odd years now. So, it it, it draws you in, and if this is this is your vacation in life, you know, I think I, yourself, you want to care, you naturally want to care for everybody. So it's not just the residents we care for, the staff are a big part of my life and I do see good in everybody, uh, unless they give me reason not to. So I think it's showing that appreciation. I know you can't have big gestures, but um, I think, government need to take that into consideration that you know the funding would help the care staff to you know to cope with everyday living and maybe if they didn't have the pressures of outside life as well as obviously when they come to work it would alleviate and show appreciation in other ways I, I know I say about monetary all the time but I don't mean it I do show well but I do show you need to show you care for people I think if you do this job, the appreciation for your staff goes a long, long way. And 
I like I do look after myself <laughs> um, and I do get appreciation as well so it's not just about me giving I do I do get as well <laughs> so yeah I think it is if the government could recognize the importance of the care sector I think this would go a long way thank you I, I think it's important for everybody to remember especially policymakers that when somebody is struggling with basics at home, whether it's their mental health well-being or paying bills or feeding their children, it's really an unfair expectation to then expect outstanding care delivery. Yeah, we need to make sure that care workers are well in themselves, at least with basic things in their life that you, you know everybody should really have, to then be able and deliver good and outstanding care. Because if you're constantly worried, it's very hard, like Andrew was saying, to put that smile on your face and go into work and do your best. And another thing that I'd like to say at the end is that we've had some great ideas you know, about things that you, you can do to support your, your team's well-being. There are a lot of other things that you can do, like participate in a fundraising work, walk for the care workers' charity or organizing a team bake sale for the care workers' charity. So I'm just putting it out there that, you know, hopefully, uh, you know, the world that we live in now, where, where we, we're being told, you know, we have to live with COVID and, and we're trying to get on with things. There's more in person activities and other events happening. Uh, you know, a lot of you will, will bear it in mind that all of those things can happen also for the good of the charity would be as good of, of, the, of the care workers. And I'd like to say a huge thank you to Andrea Fay and Sophie for sharing you, you know, your opinions and experience with us and, and great tips for the people to be able to, to use in their services to support care workers. And, and we at the Care Workers Charity are here to support people as well. And you know, in a way, I wish the charity didn't have to exist, but it does. We are more needed than, than, than ever in, in many ways. So yes, if you ever need help about anything, please do get in touch. And thanks again to our speakers today. Thank you for your time. And thanks every, for everybody who watched our session this morning and who will be watching it online later on. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.